everyone welcome to grammarly today we are going to do some combinatorics problems before you before we start this video don't forget to subscribe our youtube channel and also turn on the bell notification so you don't miss update and also don't forget to join our discord server and telegram channel so that you can be updated with all the stuff like resources videos and everything and if you like the video don't forget to put on like and also comment if there are any improvements or you have any video idea thank you let's start so uh, our first problem is from the 1964 international math olympiad and it was problem number four that is the first problem of day two so it is meant to be easy and since it is from 1964 it it should be easy so without any further delay let's start so we have 17 people which who correspond each other with mail. Uh, this shows that they are really old guys from 1964. And, and basically it means that we have a complete graph K17. If we talk in, if we say it in graph theory terminology. And, but we'll keep it simple as possible. So, and there are they only discuss three topics let the topics be x y and z and each pair of them just deal with one topic we have to prove that at least three people exist who write to each other about the same topic that is we have to prove that there exists a monochromatic triangle in a K17 uh, complete K17 that is a complete graph of 17 vertices. Uh, but we won't go to this uh, complicated stuff because uh, the audience may not be aware of graph theory and other things. And we can really go into advanced parts of this question actually. Like we can go to Ramsey numbers of uh, three variables. Uh, we have there is a thing like this Ramsey number. Of three variables, which is the word that it is 17 and other stuff. I may be wrong, so we won't use this thing, but we will just use our one really deadly weapon called the pigeon hole principle. One of the most you can say the one of the most clever techniques ever discovered. So, first, our step would be to choose a particular person A. And this guy mails mails to 16 other people on only three topics. That's kind of weird, but okay. Anyhow, let's but we can do something. So by pigeonhole principle, he must he or she must mail to six people on the same topic. On the same top. And without the loss of generality, we can just assume that this topic is X. Now, if any pair of this six people of this six people out of this six people any peer discuss this the same topic that is topic x we are done and we have to solve the problem but wait but what if this doesn't happen uh, we have to do some other stuff then we choose okay then we can conclude that all of them just discuss about topics y and z now among from the six people we fix another guy let this guy be b guy or girl whatever and this corresponds to five people this person corresponds to five people would talk 
would discuss just two topics that is y and z and we have five right so by php again that is the pigeonhole principle we can again conclude that three people three of them correspond to the same topic same topic and let this without the last loss of generality be b not b sorry y now again if a pair between them exists then we are again done we have just solved this problem we are happy everything is fine life is going on well but again the sad case when this doesn't happen actually isn't very sad because if the because if no such pair satisfies this thing in between these three people then we just get other three people who just correspond to topic z and that forms a monochromatic triangle or three people corresponding to the same name which is the desired condition so uh, it doesn't depend on how hard we try to uh, disprove it but in some way or the we will just came come back to the case where three people just discuss the same thing we have just proved to so we are done nice problem out there it was really based on logic uh, one can do it by graph theory also but it is not really needed so we are we will prevent that okay let's now move into the next question and before moving on to the next question i would like to say that uh, you should try the problem before you see see my solution uh, it for your benefit and and we will put the questions uh, in a latex file in the description and also all the links of discord and other stuff will be in the description so don't forget to check out that so now let's prove on the next problem and as said before don't forget to try this problem this was from the Indian National Math Olympiad 2015. It was again problem 4. But in more problem 4s are like not easy as it doesn't have any day 1 or 2 or anything. It just gradually, in more just gra increases gradually. Like the difficulty increases gradually. So we can consider 4 to be a moderately hard problem, but we can do it very easily using uh, recurrence relations. So let's jump into it. So what we basically do in recurrence relations, we just assume that uh, this thing is A of N, A sub N, uh, where N is the number of passes. And we define three other equations also tn c sub n and d sub n which are by far symmetric and it just sim b sub n means that uh, after n moves this returns to b it starts with a but it returns to b or it would have would have been the same as a of n. and similarly we can define c of n and d of n and the most obvious step from here will be that we can conclude that b of b sub n equals c sub n equals d sub n since this thing is pretty symmetric it doesn't matter if it's b or c or t or anything so so our main motive in this problem is to find some recursive relations, yeah. substitute the values, find the characteristic equation, and then just solve. We have to find a of seven, a sub seven, since after seven moves. Well, 
one recursion that can be easily found is that is Wi-Fi logic a sub n plus one equals three of b b sub. Now you would wonder that where that three count came from, and why would this even be true? But don't forget that we can write this thing as also as uh, v sub n plus c sub n plus g sub n. Now it seems very right. And we can see this is true. We have a, b, c, and d here. Then, if this thing is of n plus 1, and since after n passes, uh, this will just return to b and c and d, then if we just sum this, we will just get the config where after n plus 1 passes, it just go get back to a after going from this, 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 and that. So this is true, and and we have another recursion here. But first, just just try to notice it in the diagram or whatever. Since okay, we know know already that B and C sub n and D sub n are almost the same thing. And can we write B of B sub n as something? So what is A sub n minus one? A sub n minus one just says that we go from there to there and then after n minus passes, we get back to it. So, can we express it in some form that just makes our job really easy? And b sub n minus 1 is similarly after n minus 1 passes this returns. We can obtain the following recursion. But how? That's the thing we need to know. So after an a, a sub n minus 1 moves, then we get back to a, and we can simply write it as b sub n minus 1 plus c sub n minus 1. And uh, so if after this process, we can just do this uh, to get back to c or whatever. Since this is symmetric, it really doesn't matter. And we can always get back to b. So this is true. So we can now we can solve the recurrence relations easily and we get the characteristic equation as this the roots of this equation is one and negative three, I guess. Yes. And then we know that 
I think I should use darker colors. It's trivial that a sub 1 equals 0 and a sub 2 equals 3 since instead of except a there are just three things so it's it's also by far trivial and substituting these values here we just we get alpha as 1 by 4 and beta as 3 upon 4 Now we just have to find a7. We obtain the following equation. And a7 is just 546. So this problem became really easy with recursions and there are many other solutions of it like uh, you can use the cube uh, roots of unity filter in, in this but but we tried to just solve it in the most simplest way possible uh, which will be understandable for most of the audience having some background in reconciliations or something. They are really easy, so you can learn them any day. Maybe today. We don't know about them already. So now we move on to problem number three. So we have collected this problem from a book named uh, Problem Solving Methods in Combinatorics. Uh, it was written by Pablo Soberon, and it's a great book. You can try it uh, after having some. I personally think it's a hard book, so you need to have some little background before trying this book. We have a nine, we have a nine times nine board. So we can just think of it as a grid. Let's draw the grid first. Ascii color. This is a classic co uh, coloring problem, actually. And it uses one of the most deadliest weapons in human mankind, in mankind, that ever existed. That is none other than the pigeon hole principle. It's not wise to judge my drawing skills with this. It's really difficult to write with mouse. Uh, so we need to color it in some way, since I said already that it's a typical coloring problem, in some way that we can easily prove that prove the desired condition. So these colorings are really clever. So we color this thing with four colors. 
ABC and me. And we color it like this. Let's take a different color now. and so on and so forth it's not hard to calculate that there are 25 a squares and 20 b squares 20 c squares and 16 d squares So one thing we can do is that we compile A and D and B and C separately. Like um, by pigeonhole principle, our deadliest weapon, there are at least 33 insects in colors A or A and D. or B and C. We just piled up A and D and B and C separate. Just to make our job comfortable because A plus D equals 41 and B plus C is 40 which are really close and this really helps in applying the pigeonhole principle. So in the second case that is in B and C. Since uh, the insects are moving, which is a really weird thing, but we can't do anything here. Um, the insects have to turn every move. So after two steps, if the insect is in A, the insect is in A, then after two steps, it must go to B and vice versa. And same goes for others. Therefore, by PHP, we can again say that in since this things are moving. 17 lie in A or D. This this means that in some at some moment uh, there were 17 irritating insects in in D, there were because this all all the all the things are moving and after, after two steps uh, many of the insects that are in A must move on to B so there must be a case where there are seven in D and we know that there are only sixteen um, squares that are uh, colored D so again by the pigeonhole principle we can conclude that um, there are two insects. In one block, and we're done. The most um, the clever the clever part of the problem was uh, how to color, which is which this thing is uh, really you can't teach that to something. Like the motivation comes after a lot of practice. You can just you can't learn it in one day, so you need to practice a lot of problems before like mastering this kind of problems and uh, this type of coloring and invariant problems are really common these days like uh, the Indian Math Olympiad problem 6 was a problem like this and 2020 I guess and uh, 
sometimes these problems are really simple and they appear in problem six like talking about 2020 um the problem six is meant to be really hard and you shouldn't even try it if you are not a pro or something <laughs> in that particular subject like if you are not a geo guy you should not try a p6 geo in the test you should always try but you should not waste time in the contest but problem six was uh coloring and invariant problem monovariant problem i guess and it was easier than many problems in the test so many people were calling it a troll problem or something it was not very easy but it was really really doable so learning these things are really useful and let's move on to the next question now okay so this is a really classic problem involving game theory we have two piles of uh, okay first we say that there are two players a and b and we have two piles um one with one thousand one coins and one thousand coins. So uh, we need to find the winning strategy for any of the two. And in most cases, in such type of problems, uh, the winning strategy was with the first guy, that is A, the first person that pulls out the coin. It's actually obvious because the first guy always has an advantage. In some cases, it is not, but this thing is very rare. But so we will try that. To find a winning strategy for A. So what A can do is that from the pile of 1001 coins, takes up one coin. We can notice one thing that the player one player will lose if there are zero zero coins in both the piles. So if we want A to win, he has to do something that results in this 0, 0 on both the piles. So B can pick a thing and basically A wins. So what we can do is that first A takes the coin in the sec from the second pile. So B has 1000 coins in both the piles and he has to pull some of them and if he pulls like these things are now very very symmetric since 1000 coins exist in both the piles so if b pulls x number of coins then from any of the pile without the loss of generality this pile then a just pulls out another x coins from the other pile that again results then b has b has to again pull pull off uh, a coin from a or many coins from this set not a set actually but this so if a plays on the strategy at some moment we will reach uh, we will reach uh, the thing is 3 3 in both the piles 2 2 and then eventually a will take the last coin and it will be zero zero and b loses so this is a winning strategy for a it was a real classic problem and actually one of the fundamental problems when you start game theory for olympiad math now let's move on to the next question Okay, so this question has some nice wording out there. We have some fan to fancy names out there, Stephen Stupendous Smarties. Just assume this is S and J to make things simple. S and G. This this looks like an invariant problem. The reverse was okay. so I again recommend to try this problem first before seeing my solution. And this problem is uh, from a book named 
problem solving tactics uh, which is an australian book and it's a really good book for all topics it has combo geo algebra everything it is a good book you can try that out so we first draw a table we'll list up some possibilities here J S and the difference between J and S. Since the sum doesn't seem to be very useful. Okay, let's list up list some first J J and S. Let's see what happens. First, we are doing the first problem. We have two J's and zero S. We we can convert this to three two j's to three. So this becomes zero because we just swap those. Uh, the processes that are allowed are basically these. So following these four processes, we can we have to somehow reach 61. This table is really important. If you think that you can skip this part, then you are totally wrong. Uh, for at later we will realize how important this thing was. First of all, it just seems as a mere observational thing that helps us to visualize but it's not it's really important in this way we can continue from these four processes from zero we get again one i one Hmm, now we are really close to sixty one. We can do one thing, we can swap two of the J's and this s is also really really low that is only one so if we soft swap two of them four so from the table we can conclude that uh, there may exist like um there may exist that uh this, this can be true at one two or three but 
the least value we have obtained from this table, table is 4. Can we somehow prove that uh, the 4 is the least value and this things just don't work? Actually, we can. First, we can consider the sum of j and s. Um, we get two. We get two here, and then three, four, five, seven, ten, four. It seems really, really random. But if we consider the difference, first we get two. We get negative three. We get two. We get negative three. And then we get seven. And sorry, negative eight, I guess. Then we get twelve. Seventeen. Sorry, twenty seven. Get it 43 60. Let's see, it's just I get it 60. No, not negative 62. And this is 57. If we take mod 5 here, then we always get 2 mod 5. That is uh, J minus S mod 5. J minus S congruence to modulo 5. Therefore, we can conclude that. Not conclude actually, but we can guess that this is an invariant. But we have to prove that. J minus mod 5 is an invariant. We haven't proved it, proved it yet, but we will prove it now. Okay, so we have the pair J and S. The only possible the pair this pair can become any of this four. How is that so? Since we can swap two things with three things as in the problem statement. So if we swap, uh, if we swap three J's, then we get two of them. And if we swap two, then we get three. And so these are true. Now we can consider their differences, which are the only possible pairs. And we notice that if we consider this difference, then we get j minus s minus 5. We see that all of the differences are just j minus s plus minus 5. Therefore, it goes good enough.
therefore it must be invariant. J minus S mod 5 is invariant. Now we have proved it. Now it's the problem is quite easy from now. Um, initially we had two j's, so here it is j minus s congruence to mod five, and we need sixty one of them. So sixty one. minus s to mod 5 now for s to be minimum uh, 61 minus s has to be 57 so s equals 4 so from here we get that the minimum is Four, and we have proved it. But one here we have proved that lower values just can't exist. Not values, but like you can just swap them. And the invariant also doesn't show us that this must exist. This shows that uh, this is the least possible thing. Uh, so the existence of the swap is uh, wholly dependent on this the table we made. This shows that it is actually possible to op obtain 61 with 4s. So this must be true and we are done. So um, thank you for watching and I hope you like the video and don't forget to subscribe our channel, uh, check out Discord server, subscribe to our telegram channel other social media handles. Thank you.